Welcome to our last in the series, Complete Restoration. Today we will come to the grand finale and pull it all together. Before we do that, let's ask for God's spirit and his guidance to be with us. Heavenly Father, our creator and our God. Father, the worst thing we can do is think that we have the answers without seeking your guidance and your wisdom. So Lord, as we open your word, we ask again humbly, Lord, for you to lead us and guide us for your truth and your character to shine forth. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Here comes the peace, the last piece to pull all the other pieces together and make those three angels' messages flow and make sense for the times in which we live. I can't show you all the pieces because clearly there are many, many things to know about God and we cannot never cover them in one series. We're told we won't cover his greatness in all of eternity. But I can show you one last critical piece for these three angels messages that will give you a deeper understanding of them. This one piece makes the puzzle work. And the Bible would say this last piece is the chief cornerstone. It's time to see what this seed of truth is made of. What kind of plant are we going to have? So far, we've covered that Babylon has fallen. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was a temporary kingdom, so we know that Satan's dominion and the slavery and oppression of sin are only temporary, and we do not need to be afraid of the enemy. Babylon is fallen. We've covered the judgment. We learned the judgment is not bad news. The judgment is God's rescue plan for planet Earth to bring Satan and his followers to accountability. We've covered the everlasting gospel in two phases. First, we learned that it is good news. We learned that it is not only good news, but what we have seen as 10 commandments to be accomplished by us are actually Jesus' testimony to us of what he will do. And that leads into the next one, that Jesus will restore. He knows we're broken. He knows our frame. He knows we're dust. He knows where we came from. He knows everything about us. He knows that we are broken, that that does not bother him. He will restore. We learned that fearing God, far from being afraid of God, he says, I don't want you to be afraid. Over and over, the Bible says, fear not, be not afraid, do not fear. God does not want us to be afraid of him. He wants us to see how great he is so that nothing else scares us. That's the fear of God. When we fear God, we will do anything for him because we understand that he loves us. Everything he asks is for our benefit and we can trust him. To give him glory, we learned, is to have his character reflected in us and through us because he is the only one that has glory. We have none of our own. And to try and replace his glory with ours is just not going to work at all. Worship him. We learn that worship happens when we have an encounter with God that makes us see him for what he is, makes us realize who we really are, and we fall on our face like Moses, like Joshua, like so many in the Bible, Isaiah, and we worship. Last lecture, we covered the maddening wine. In Adventism, we've understood the maddening wine of her adulteries to be the false doctrines that have entered into Christianity. And that is true. There have been many corruptions, they're called, but the underlying corruption that that undermines them all, where they all spring out of the root of the whole plant, is unbelief. The idea that God is not able to do that which he says he can do, therefore we are on our own to do it and figure it out for ourselves, to produce our own glory, our own righteousness, and create our own destiny. It is the lie of Babylon. Now, we are going to go into the third angel. We have spent six sessions on the first angel's message, two on the second angel's message, and we have one left to cover the third angel. It is a long message. This is no, in no way a comprehensive analysis of the third angel's message, but it will give you the essence of what God wanted us to know. <clears throat> what message does this message have for us? 
First, I have to tell you, I've been a Seventh-day Adventist. I was born a Seventh-day Adventist. My parents were Seventh-day Adventists, my grandparents, my great-grandparents. So I was raised a Christian. I was raised with Seventh-day Adventist understanding of the Bible. I have been preaching the gospel as a, as a minister for 13 years. I have avoided this message. And I have avoided this message simply because I could see no good news there. And I knew the message was supposed to be good news, and if I didn't understand it, obviously I'm not going to preach it. And then God turned the light on. In fact, in the last year, my understanding of the three angels' messages has exploded, and it continues to explode as I see what God has really been trying to say all along. Here's the message. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, a megaphone, a megaphone, if anyone hears, <coughs> sorry, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write this down, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works follow them. Let's start with the bad news. First of all, it is true. Many people don't even want to talk about these messages because they see them as scary, and we'd like to avoid fearful things. It's like we've covered through this whole series. Fear paralyzes people. It makes us want to close our ears and close our eyes. It is true that there have been and are and will be many who choose to reject Jesus. What has been will be again. There's nothing new under the sun. The, Jesus said the, there's two paths. One is wide, one is narrow. The wide path is what most people take. It is true that most people, or at least many people, will reject Jesus. It is also true that these people through history have come under Satan's deceptive, deceptive influence have worked together to harass, misrepresent, and even murder God's followers. I mean, do you think for one moment that Cain, when he started to entertain the idea that his fruit that he was producing should be good enough for God, do you think when that, when that seed began to grow in his mind, when he began to think that through, do you think he ever dreamed that that thinking would lead to him killing his brother? Of course he never thought that. But when we head down the road of Satan's deceptions, we don't know where it will lead, but it won't lead anywhere good. And it's true that people will continue to head down that road. And those who do will turn on those who are trying to stay with Jesus. It is true that this cycle is not over. It is true that in the future, God's followers, like so many in the past, will become enemies of the state, enemies of other people, enemies of those who are trying to reject God. The last days of this earth's history will call for men and women. Men and women who will stand up like Elijah stood up before Ahab. Men and women who will stand up like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood before Nebuchadnezzar. Men and women who say, God, I will stand for you no matter what may come because I trust you. I believe you. I will do the things you ask me to do. I don't think I can. I don't think it'll work. I don't think it's possible. I don't think all kinds of things, but I know that you can be trusted, so I will do whatever you want. It is true that there will be giants before us, giants that appear indestructible, walls that seem insurmountable, challenges that defy human ability, no matter how able you may be. More and more in the church, I'm becoming concerned because I see us as a people being more and more afraid of of money, of issues, of all kinds of things, and we look and we magnify problems instead of magnifying the greatness of our God. Just Just like the Israelites went up on the mountain, those 12 spies, and looked over into the promised land, yes, there were blessings, yes, it was great, yes, it was good, but all they saw above and beyond God's ability was 
the obstacles. We need to see God as so big that no obstacle is an obstacle at all. It is true that the temptation will come to surrender, to give in, and to give up. Just because we love Jesus, just because we're walking with him, just because we're being restored, just because we've begun the journey, just because we're on the way to the kingdom with Jesus does not mean discouragement won't come. Does not mean the temptation to give up won't come. It will come. Restoration is a long, messy, and difficult process, but Jesus has committed himself to get the job done. Even this is good news. Do you know why? Everything we said here is bad news. Do you know why it's good news? Think about this. When Satan tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, did he tell her the whole story? Did he tell her what was going to happen after she ate the fruit? He told her some true things. He said, you know, when you eat this, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He was right. God had experienced through Satan's own <clears throat> rejection of, of, him, of God, he had experienced good and evil. He had seen one third of the angels torn away from him. He had experienced good and evil, and now Adam and Eve are going to experience the horrors of evil. That was true. But they didn't know what it meant. They didn't know it was going to bring shame and fear and hurt. They didn't know it was going to cost them the garden. They didn't know it was going to lead to one of their sons killing their other sons. They didn't know any of that. He didn't tell them. He didn't want them to know. If he'd told them that, they might not have done it. That's why he's the deceiver. It's good news that Jesus tells us the whole story. Think about it. Can you make a good decision? Can you make an informed decision? Can you, can you be treated in a fair way if someone doesn't tell you the whole story? Jesus, as painful as what the story of our rejection will cost us is, he tells us because he loves us. He says, if you go this way, this will happen. If you go this way, this will happen. In Deuteronomy, it's described as the blessings and the cursing. This will lead to this. This will lead to this. I'm telling you because I love you. I'm telling you because I want you to know the whole story. I don't want you to make a decision based on half of the information. Just to illustrate the point, a somewhat comical story is told of four politicians dying. Theologically incorrect story, but it makes a point. They die, they show up at the gates of heaven, and Peter meets them there as many of these stories go. And they ask St. Peter if they can go into heaven, and Peter says, well... Before you go, don't you want to make sure that that's where you want to go? And so they say, well, of course that's where we want to go. He says, oh, no, no, wait. Don't you, you, you need to see both sides. You need to see the whole story first. So he gives them a tour of heaven, and people are happy there, and all is peaceful and well, and it's good. And they say, yeah, we definitely want to stay here. Then they <clears throat> says, no, no, you've got to come. You've got to see hell first. So they take him to hell. And they get there, and a lot of their buddies are there, and they're drinking, and they're having a good time. They're playing golf. All is fun and games. They say, man, like, maybe we were wrong. We were, we were told that hell was this place of torment and terrible. We, it's clearly not. Let's go here. So they make their choice, and then they find themselves in hell, and it is fire and torment. And they complain and say, this is not what you showed us. This is not what you presented to us. And they said, oh yeah, well yesterday, what I showed you yesterday was only the campaign. This is the reality after the campaign. It makes a political joke, but it makes a point. You can't make the right decision or even an informed decision if you don't know the whole story. Jesus tells the whole story. But that is just the beginning of the good news in this message. A third angel followed and said, if. I-F, that little tiny word that Satan uses to imply doubt, here is used in a very different way. If anyone worships. You see, if means I'm free. 
If means I have options. If means I don't have to bow before the Satan-inspired forces that demand I bow or burn. This beast and its image described in this message that make me want to that want to force me to worship them, that want me to take on their mark, the things they want to do, I don't have to do them. All because of that little word, if, means I'm free. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were standing there, they were told they had no choice, but they knew they did because they knew there was a God greater than them. They knew that even if, whether God rescued them that day or restored them when he came again, either way, God was going to take care of them. They knew they had options. If. If means we are free. Consider Satan's attacks on Jesus. If you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. If you are, cast yourself down. If you are, bow and worship me and I will give you all these things. Jesus knew who he was. And because he knew who he was, he knew that he didn't have to. He knew he didn't have to provide his own bread because he knew that God had a mission for him. He knew that God was not going to let him starve to death. He knew that he was not going to die. He knew that God was going to take care of him. He was free to make the choice. He was free to make the choice not to cast himself down because he knew he didn't need to test God's faithfulness. He already knew that God was faithful. I don't need to prove his faithfulness. I don't need to run out in the street in front of a Mack truck to see if God's going to take care of me. I don't need to do that because I know he is taking care of me. And when Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the earth, Jesus knew the kingdom he had come from. He knew what Eden was like before the earth went astray. And as beautiful as we think some things in this world are, they pale in comparison. Jesus knew the truth. And the truth set him free. You see, temptations only have power if you don't know the truth. I mean, think about it. Satan doesn't tell you when you're tempted to have an affair the ramifications that will have. Satan doesn't tell you when you're tempted to put whatever you want in your body because it tastes good. He doesn't warn you while you're doing that what it could lead to down the road. Satan doesn't tell you the whole story. He just says, oh, try this. Oh, try this. Oh, that's good for you. Oh, that feels good, doesn't it? Go, go, go. He doesn't tell young boys, young teenagers, when they get on the computer and get involved in pornography, he doesn't tell them the road that could take them down. He doesn't want them to know. He doesn't tell them when they take the first cigarette that they may never be able to stop. He doesn't want them to know. He doesn't want them to know that when they can't stop, their lungs are going to fill up and they won't be able to to exercise or do any of the things they used to do, that it will start to destroy their health. He doesn't want them to know. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you want someone who's going to tell you the real deal, If you want someone who's going to tell you the whole story, if you want to see the real picture, you need to talk to Jesus. Jesus lived his ministry for his father. One day he was talking to the woman at the well. His disciples went into the town to get food. They came back with the food and they said, Jesus, Rabbi, eat something but he was busy talking to the woman because she needed hope and help. And he said, my food is to do the will of my father and to finish his work. Jesus poured out his life here on this earth, doing what his father asked him to do because he loved his father and he believed his father could complete the mission he had sent him on. When the mission came to a head, And he found himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. The 12 men he had trained for those three years, only three of them were there with him. And when he went back to get support from them, they were asleep. All he asked them for was to pray with him, and they slept. He was just him and God. 
All the sins of humanity, all the guilt, all the shame was piling up on him. He was in the worst mess he had ever been in as a human being. And he told his father, Father, if this cup can pass for me, if there's any way out of here, if please, this is terrible. I don't want to do this, but I want to do what you want me to do. I want to finish what you want me to finish. Father, if this is the only way that we can complete the mission to save your children, then this is what I will do. Jesus wanted us to know. He tells us the whole story. He exposes himself. He is vulnerable. He says, when you come through these situations where, like Abraham offering his son, where this is horrific, this is not what I want to do, this is bad, he admits it. He says, that's how I felt. But I didn't listen to my feelings because I knew the truth. The truth is my father loves me. The truth is my father has a plan that's good. The truth is when I finish his plan and look back, I would have chosen no other way than his way. The truth is I can trust my dad. Then he went to the cross. And as he's hanging there dying, he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Didn't God say, I will never leave you nor forsake you? Is Jesus finally cracking? Is he finally admitting? No. What Jesus is doing on the cross is telling us what that hour felt like. When he became sin for us and the Father turned his face away, he was left alone. Alone, yes. Feeling forsaken, yes. But forsaken, no. How do I know that he knew that he wasn't forsaken? How do I know that as he hung there, he knew better? Because he said this, Father, Daddy, into your hands do I commit my life. And then he died. The last thing Jesus did was give himself to the Father. You see, Jesus knew what it takes us a long time to learn, what some of us never learn. Jesus knew that the only answer, the only answer that has any real result was to put his life in his Father's hands. Yes, he felt forsaken, but he knew that he was not. You see, truth is powerful. When you decide to believe what God says, lies have no power anymore. And so when feelings come that are contrary to the word of God, you answer, it is written. I may feel forsaken, but I am not. And so, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Here is the patience of the saints. Ends the third angel's message. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write it down, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors. Imagine the angels, you know, we struggle to stay alive and the angels say, oh, finally they can rest. The angels know what we struggle through. God knows what we struggle through. His spirit knows what we struggle through. They know it's not fun to be here. Ah, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. You say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. You said last presentation that it's not about our works. We'll see. 
I am the God, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. Here are those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Here are those who say, I know what your law means, and I'm not letting it go. You see, the Sabbath, we open that up. The Sabbath is the truth that God made me. The Sabbath is the truth that God will deliver us from our enemies. The Sabbath is the truth that Jesus will restore us. You see, to reject the Sabbath is to reject that I have a father who made me. To reject the Sabbath is to reject that I have a father who delivers me from my enemies. To reject the father is to reject the one who wants to restore me. If I reject my maker, my deliverer, and my restorer, what do I have left? Nothing. And so the patience of the saints is, God, I don't know how long this process is going to take. I don't know how long it's going to take for you. How long, O Lord, how long, I don't know, but I am not letting go. I have nothing else. When Jesus asked Peter, Peter, are you going to leave me too with the rest of them? No, no, Jesus, if I left you, where would I go? You have the words of eternal life. When Jesus rewrote his testimony, they thought they had, God had given up on them, that they had failed and the covenant was over. He rewrote them and said, remember, you were slaves and I set you free. If I could set you free from slavery, I can fix what's wrong with you as well. Remember. Remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath because the Sabbath will tell you about me. Why does Satan hate the Sabbath? Because he is terrified. He is terrified that in the heart of the Sabbath, you will discover that you are free. You say, well, what do you mean I'm free? I struggle with this and I struggle with that. Listen, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free and you will be free indeed. Is the Bible true or isn't it? When I was <clears throat> at home as a, in my teen years, we had a dog, his name was Chief. He was a mixture of Black Lab and Collie. This is not a picture of him, but it looks very much like him. It's the closest I could find. He was a good dog. In fact, he was such a good dog that I've had two dogs since. One was a Collie Lab mix, and this one is a Lab Beagle mix. They make beautiful dogs. I wanted to get another Lab Collie mix. I couldn't find one. This dog, Chief, he had a problem, though. He liked to chase cars. We lived on a farm, rural community, dirt road. Not a lot of cars went by, but it only takes one car to kill the dog. So we would tie him up. <clears throat> he had a long, long chain that he was on. He could go around most of the yard, but the chain had its limit. And when we first tied him to the chain, a car, I remember distinctly watching him, a car came, he went running across the yard, he came to the end of the chain, the chain came tight, and he kept on going, and the chain caught him and flipped him right around. He came to the end of the chain. But as time passed, and he did that a couple more times, he learned that there was a limit, and he couldn't pass the limit. So then when cars came, he would run, but as soon as he came to the end of the chain, he would stop. He didn't like that. I can't blame him. So he learned. And then I learned something. I learned that I could unhitch his chain on the far end, not off his collar, on the other end. And if I did it and he didn't notice, a car could come by and Chief would go running after that car and as soon as he came to the distance where the chain ended, he stopped. Even though he was not chained. He wasn't chained, but he didn't know it. And because he didn't know it, he wasn't free. 
You see, the truth is, what we believe is what we become. Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. We read a quote from Ellen White a few sessions ago where she says, it's out of, <clears throat> it's out of us what we are. Our actions are a product of who we are. The things we do are not the issue. The things we do are only a byproduct of the character we have. How could we ever be free if we don't know we're free? Jesus came to set us free. You will call his name Jesus because he will save his people in their sins. No, 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 no. You will call his name Jesus because he will save his people with their sins. Oh, no. You will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The truth is that you are free. You may not feel free. You may not have progressed enough in your restoration to experience the freedom that you have. Not because you aren't free, but because there's still more unbelief in you than there is belief in you. He's not done yet. You keep walking with him. He will set you free because he is the truth and you will know the truth. You will know Jesus and Jesus will set you free. You want to read your Bible and have your Bible come along? Every time the word truth occurs in your Bible, scratch it out and put Jesus' name there. He is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the missing piece. You may feel like the one in the top corner, but when Jesus is done, you will be the one in the bottom corner because Jesus says he will finish what he started. He will be faithful to complete the good work that he has begun until the day he comes. Jesus does not give up. Remember in Isaiah says, he is never discouraged. A smoking flax he will not quench. He is faithful. Is the truth, capital T, starting to come alive? Are you seeing his picture? Inside those three angels' messages, one, two, three, it's Jesus, 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 he is the everlasting gospel. He is the one who loves us from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Why? Because in the book of Acts, he says, from one blood, he made all the nations. For us to divide ourselves and think one is better than the other is nonsense when you know the truth. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. You know, the Bible does describe heaven a little bit. It says that heaven has 12 gates, every gate a single pearl. Jesus is the pearl of great price. Pick your door. It doesn't matter. If you're not going in through Jesus, you're not going in. What does Jesus want from you? Follow me, and I will make you become. He's not asking you to become. He's inviting you to become. Think about it. There is a reason that Jesus began his life here on earth as a craftsman. You know, we call him a carpenter, but the actual Greek word is artisan. It means he was a hands-on tradesperson. He worked with his hands. He could do stonework. He could do woodwork. He could do all kinds of things. Why did he begin his life that way? Because he transitioned from a builder of things to a builder of men. The Bible says we are a spiritual house being built up. Each one of us a spiritual stone with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. God is in the building business and we are the object of his construction. He is rebuilding his people. Your puzzle will always be incomplete without me, says Jesus. Without me, you can do no good thing. I am the one who can put all your broken, confusing pieces together. I am he. 
I will overcome in you and give you victories that you never dreamed possible. You know, as I've gone deeper and deeper into this study, I've realized, you know what? I haven't become all I can be in Jesus for one big reason. I don't even believe it's possible. I didn't even see how good it could be. Why? Because Jesus says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Because I began the work in you and I will complete it until I come because I am the author and perfecter of your faith because I always keep my promises. If you want me, consider it done. If you put Jesus in charge of your life, completion of the project is guaranteed. He will restore. Mothers and fathers, if you have children out there and you're worried about them and you're trying to save them, take that burden off your shoulders. Jesus says, take your burdens and give them to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I will redeem your children. Jesus is not asking us to save ourselves or anyone else. He's asking us to introduce everyone to him. He will save them. A beautiful, completed puzzle. You shall become the ones in whom I am well pleased because I am faithful. What he is, the Bible says, we shall become. Here is the patience of the saints, the last part of the third angel's message. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I heard a voice from heaven say to me, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, write it down that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Their works, yes. John 6, 28, 29, they said to him, <clears throat> the multitude of people was there, they were asking him questions. They said, Jesus, what do we need to do? that we may work the works of God. What is it that you want from us? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. This is the work you'll be judged on. This is the work that will put you in the Lamb's book of life, to believe on him whom he sent. Those who have the Son have life. Those who do not have the Son do not have life. It's that simple. In conclusion, there are three angels there are three messages. Let's put the puzzle together based on all the pieces that we have found in his word. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting, unchanging good news to proclaim with joy to everyone, no matter who, no matter where, no matter what. The message was loud and clear. See God for who he is. See his greatness ever in front of you so that all other fearful things melt away in his awesome presence. Choose through his greatness to give up on yourself and allow him to remake you into a son, into a daughter that brings him glory. It may not seem like it now, but he is judging your adversaries and his rescue mission is underway and is right on schedule. Worship him. Fall on your face before the one who fled the security and peace and joy of heaven for you. Worship the one who knelt in the dust to make us, who fell in the dust carrying our sins up a hill called Calvary and hung, misunderstood and alone to make your restoration possible. Worship the one who had a plan in place for your rescue before you ever knew you were lost. Worship him who declares week by week, I set you free and I won't give up until you are well done, good and faithful servant. Worship him. Another angel followed and the message was loud and clear. The lie that you are still in bondage is exposed. Babylon has fallen. You are not alone. You are not a cosmic accident. Your destiny does not depend on your ability to save yourself. The lie that infiltrated every religion that you must earn, pay, scrape, and appease your way back to an angry, estranged God is not true. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. You are not the answer. He is. 
A third angel followed close behind. This message was loud and clear. The lies will persist. And if you believe them, you will suffer now and die in the end. But you don't have to believe them. The power of these lies has been broken. They have been exposed. Jesus proved that heaven is not angry with us and that our rescue does not depend on us. While we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. Jesus in God, in Christ, God reconciled us to himself. Heaven is not against you. Heaven is working overtime on your behalf. Wait patiently for him. The rescue mission is being carried out as we speak. He will be in time and on time. Wait patiently for him. Hold on to the testimony that he has given you. Hold up his truth as the antidote for the lies of Babylon. The same faith that carried Jesus through whatever, from Gethsemane to Calvary, the same faith that allowed Jesus to leave heaven and work out on his, a life of perfection on our behalf, the same faith that carried Jesus from heaven through earth, through the grave, and back to heaven, the same faith will carry you through whatever may come. Even if you die, it's okay. He knows who are his. Don't be afraid, little flock because it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I can serve a Jesus like that, and so can you. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, we stand before you, broken people, We have unbelief in our hearts. We doubt you. We tend to trust ourselves, even though we know we're broken, more than we trust you. But Father, you have given us the truth. Jesus has set us free. Help us to live that freedom. Help us to let you do the work in us that you've promised to do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.